So I was going to say is, uh, is that how your mead comes? Because I thought it came in maybe like a big giant milk truck full of honey and then they just kind of like pumped it out. It's always coming like the 50 gallon barrels like this. We, so almost all of our, milk our truck honey. Full of honey. <laughs> I, mean, I won't be here that day when that actually happens. They, they do, no, they do, do they that. Do that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And they use, they use right, totes, I'm the you know, like 500 up, gallon totes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So most of our honey. All right, guys. Welcome to the episode of Hoppy Craftsman. I am Chris. I'm Jeff. I'm Nate. And we are here in Prescott, Arizona. Yes. With Jeff Herbert from Superstition Meadery. Awesome. Thanks. We're at your uh, production facility right now. We are. And it's, and it's a nice area, man. It's very picturesque outside. It's a, lo- a long overdue gathering at the Superstition Meadery. Cool. I'm glad to have you guys. We've Thank been, you very much. We've been waiting for this one for a while. Absolutely. Uh, already starting off with some blueberry spaceship box, by the way. Thank you very much. Cheers. Excited yeah. about that. Very good. Uh, just have that on tap here in the. Uh, that's not that probably doesn't get old. At least it doesn't seem like it would. No, I love it. And yeah. uh, it, you know, you go through phases um, when I go to the tasting room as far as what I'm drinking. But right. I remember last summer for like two months, that's all I had <laughs> when I would go in there. So it's cool. And that's my old uh, homebrew kegerator. Nice. So nice. It uh, it actually was commercially used in our tasting room until we could afford, you know, <laughs> some better gear. But that's great. Now it's a uh, it's our uh, you know, the production place, awesome kegerator, which is awesome. That is. So we do a weird, not necessarily weird, but uh, a segment on the show. It's called Rapid Round. Uh, it's not rapid. That's kind of the ironic thing. Yeah, it usually takes a while. It takes a while. Cool. Uh, but we call it the Rapid Round. So we kind of want to start with that first. Uh, and it's our first. I mean, this is our first uh, metery. This right. is our first time not doing a uh, a brewery, so uh, yeah, some we are some of these are craft beer related, but Chris is Chris has got a good good set of questions. <laughs> sure. Cool. So uh, the first one's usually what beer got you into craft beer. So we'll, we can start with that and then go from there. No, that's a great question. So uh, a friend of mine introduced uh, homebrew uh, to us. So it's actually kind of a crazy story. Okay, no, so perfect. We love stories. Perfect. So um, my undergrad degree was in anthropology. And so that's where the whole superstition, you know, idea came from. History, religion, mythology, it's totally intertwined with mead. And so that's how we picked the name. And as part of that interest, I was also interested in like photography and travel and stuff. And I was in Borneo and I was, that's a really long side story. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, you know, you hang out with other travelers and um, I was hanging out with the owner of this um, like youth hostel kind of place, hotel in the city where everyone would, you know, hang out when they were you know, waiting to go dive in or into the jungle or whatever for a trek. And so there were some, some guys hanging out and were like having some Guinness at a cafe. And uh, it turned out that he uh, had grown up in Arizona and was a biologist doing work in Borneo. And so we just were like, well, that's cool. St- stay in touch. <laughs> what are the chances of that? Yeah, yeah, right? That's crazy. Bizarre. Yeah. He grew up like 10 minutes from where we were living in the valley at the time. Wow. And so we just stayed in touch with email and um, he'd come visit his folks once a year. And so uh, one time he brought some homebrew over as, you know, like a gift for the dinner we were having, hanging out with some friends, and I couldn't stop talking about it. So I always liked, um, you know, cooking and, and all that. My wife and I are, are kind of into that, not like culinary school trained by any means, but, you know, it's always fun coming up with stuff. So, um, you know, if you guys have homebrewed or anyone listening knows that, you know, it's a lot like cooking and you're, you know, you're pairing flavors and stuff. And so uh, I got home from uh, from the fire station on Father's Day, six months after like first trying homebrew. And my wife had a homebrew kit and a refrigerator and a shelving unit. And my first beer was terrible. But before it was done fermenting, I went to the homebrew store in Tempe and I said, hey, I want to make a Belgian beer because I like those and I want to make a mead. And I had just known what mead was, right? right? So ironically, also, right after like learning about homebrew, um, I was on my 10-year wedding anniversary and we happened to pass through Belgium. And so I drank a Chimay Blue in Brussels and I was like, this is awesome. And so I've been on this like Trappist kick the whole time. So if you're talking about what got me right, into it, I got hooked on Trappist beers real early. And if you were at my house right now, you'd see like, a, a, you know, a bunch of them. Get a sermon. <laughs> so, Get a sermon. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And that's, that's probably when I was homebrewing, it was like half trappist stuff. And then I would always throw in, you know, like an Imperial Stout or Maple Porter or Hefeweizen or something to try and get, you know, different, different things in the lineup. And I would, I was probably brewing like two beers a month and like a mead every month or two, depending on, you know, what was going on. And, you know, mead, especially at the time, took longer to make than beer. So that's kind of how it paced out. Mm-hmm. And uh, first mead I ever made was a maple mead. And it was, you know, for Thanksgiving. Oh, nice. Wound up being pretty good. So kept making those. And then, you know, I was 
you know, I would look at, um, you know, like a clone recipe for beer I liked and I would change mm. something about it, the yeast or an adjunct or, you know, some, some oak or whatever. And I just started doing the same thing with mead, you know, like coming up with whatever vanilla beans and a lot of the things that, that we use today yeah. came from those early recipes, which okay. is really cool. That so there was cool. years of that recipe development and formulation, um, Anyways, that's, that's super well, interesting. Your question. No, no, yeah. I'm just like, keep going. That's great. No, Never, well, it's super interesting. It's like, you know, you said you, you homebrewed beer and you didn't meet. I was, was going to ask, I was like, you know, what, what, at what point were you like, you know what, I'm just going to stop homebrewing the beer and actually focus on just doing meat instead? When I was homebrewing, I never stopped. Okay. Like, I didn't stop homebrewing until I got my commercial winery license oh, to really? make meat because I didn't have time. Yeah. But I was making beer, meat, and cider like for years, right up until the point of sort of going pro mm -hmm. where, you know, it's just there's not time to home. I mean, I think yeah. I probably brewed once or twice after I, you know, got a license. And so, and now when we go to do a collaboration, you know, it's fun to go and, and do brew days at breweries. Yeah. And often we're using honey or, you know, something that's right. representative of what we do with our style. Um, but, you know, we're making beer when we're in that situation, which is a lot of fun. So yeah. I miss that. And it's cool to get back into it. I love that double IPA you guys did with Rent House. The uh, colony collapse. Yeah, that was awesome, and that was yeah. the first time we did a collab and didn't use honey. That was what so I say, yeah. that was really kind of fun for us too. Just doing a, a you know, beer so, style or whatever, yeah. without honey in it. But um, but it was great, and then of course the name and all ties into the the story. So right, right. <clears throat> um, when you were uh, yeah, just just to, to continue with your home brewing, when at what point did you were you making the transition when you knew you were going to go pro? Well, that requires a little bit of the the story, I guess, on how we yeah. started. So, um. You know, as a, a fireman for my like regular job, lots of firemen have side gigs, right? Like right. construction or real estate or whatever, whatever it is. And I was considering different things, you know, to just do something else in life as I was promoting at work or whatever. Um, and with home brewing, you know, friends come over drinking your, you know, five, 10 gallon batches of beer for free and they're like, you should sell this shit. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I say it's the, it's the yeah, typical yeah, right. story. It's like, you should, you should be a chef or you should be a brewer. <laughs> right. I, you right. get that all the time, you know, you have picnics and it's well, like, dude, you should be a professional chef. It's like, eh, I'm well, good. It's, it's tough because it's your friends, right? So you're like, and they're getting free beer. Yeah. So right. you're like, uh, <laughs> yeah. They could tell me it's gonna be horrible. I don't know, really. Well, right. you're right, and and I didn't put too much credence in that, right? And so <laughs> yeah. I'd have like a West Mall triple, and then my triple, and be like, yeah, that's not, it's not from Belgium. <laughs> I still like it, but you know, yeah. So um, you know, it was it's always nice to get compliments, but I didn't have any um friends that that homebrewed. I wasn't in like a club. Like I knew no mm. one that was involved in it. it. Was just me being self taught, picking stuff up off books, internet, whatever. Very cool. So um, I just kept running with it, but I started to look into well, what does it mean to have a business. And, you know, we had some friends that had totally non-industry related businesses. And so I started asking questions when we'd go out to dinner, like, what advice do you have? And people would say, you need to learn the industry before you try and have a business in the industry. And mm -hmm. so that, like, that was just an example of some good advice I got. And so I started learning about the industry as much as I could. And so anytime we traveled anywhere, it was brew pubs. And fortunately, my kids were pretty young at the time. But as you guys know, you go to a brew pub and they got coloring pages and pretzels and sodas and stuff. So yeah. it wound up working out. And then, you know, going to California and taking trips to wine country and just going to, I mean, like Los Olivos. I don't know how many dozens of like wine tasting rooms there are that we went to. And like a, we didn't drink in all of them. Right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you just walk in, check it out, take notes. And we started to figure things out like, well, we got little kids and you better have something to charge the iPhone if you're going to sit there and do a flight and talk to the winemaker. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, like when we designed our tasting room, it was like, well, we better have outlets scattered around the room and things that, right. you know, you wouldn't necessarily think you would need. So um, anyways, my wife and I were taking notes and doing that all over the country, all over the world. Whenever we went anywhere, we have family in like all different states. So, you know, whenever we went anywhere, that's that's what we did. And so we did that for years, awesome. um, sort of informally, right, at first. And mm -hmm. then when I started thinking about what's this really mean, um, I went to Chicago to the Siebel Institute and I took a class on how to start a brewery. And so I was in the second time that they'd ever done that and I didn't know anything. And so for me, that was a big deal. That was the first time I spent a penny on business development because it was, you know, airfare, flight, yeah. class, all that stuff. So, you know, it's like a couple grand for this weekend um, or whatever to get there. So it was a three day class. I felt like I got an MBA in three days. <laughs> right. um, it was crazy. <laughs> Drinking from the fire hose kind of. Yeah. You, you learn how true. to write a business plan from people that just wrote one, were successful with it and had a good brewery. Right. And wow. so there were, um, That's awesome. you know, and the, the people teaching you were like, Randy Mosher, Ray Daniels, like, and I didn't know who these guys were. They're all authors of books and they're famous. And, and so, um, the first question they asked, it was 40 of us and there were people from Panama, Canada, even, uh, like Jackie O's brewery was there. They'd already opened up, but there were people getting like more advice on how to, you know, have their brewery run well or whatever. So it was like that level of, of, of people in there. And they said, uh, Hey, who here is an award-winning home brewer? 
And everyone but me raised their hand. And I looked at the guy next to me and I said, they have competitions for this? I, mean, I had no idea. Yeah, right. And so they're like, they told me like what that means. Yeah, That's feedback from the so judges cool. and all this. So I got home. I started entering competitions, mead, cider, beer. And I started getting good scores, winning medals like right away. So I thought, what's well, not just my friend saying this stuff's good. <laughs> nice. You know, like maybe there's something to it. And mm -hmm. so I figured you can't have a business if you don't have a good product, right? Right. And then it was just reading all the books, like, you know, Sam's Dogfish Head book, How Do You Start a Brewery, All Brewing Up a Business, all that stuff. So anything I could absorb, that's what we did. We, um, you know, my wife and I sat down, wrote a business plan, um, and then we sold our house and moved to Prescott. And Very within awesome. um, a couple of weeks of being here, we went to the closest winery, which was in Skull Valley. It was called Juniper Wall Ranch, and brought homebrew with me, you know, and the owners invited us to hang out and, and make wine with them. Nice. And, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek, oh, you should make your mead here. And I said, well, that's funny because... I was about to start seriously looking for you know, like some kind of very humble commercial space in Prescott to you know have either a brewery or a meter. I didn't know which direction I was going to really? go at the time. And so this opportunity came up where we became apprentices in a winery and we did everything for prune vines for you know like eight months. Nice. And so the home brewing background I had really parlayed well into helping out with bottling and you know, rack and barrels and, and even like, you know, the whole process of making right. wine. So we learned a lot and we sort of, you know, proved ourselves. And, um, you know, by the, before the next wine season or whatever came up, we were applying for the first uh, alternating proprietorship in Arizona. So an AP is where one separate license winery or brewery, or I think a distillery may be able to do that. Um, you, you rent space in another alcohol producing facility but you're responsible for your own taxes, licenses, in our case, formulas, label approval, all of that. And so, you know, in the brewing world, there's um, contract brewing Rare where enough. you can pay someone to do all that for you and but you can still like have a brand, but you're not responsible necessarily for... Like a gypsy brewer almost, right? right. Yeah, that would be a good example of that as well. Okay. So in the wine world, they have the same thing. It's really common and it's called custom crush. Oh, okay. So, you know, you're crushing the grapes. So that's, they don't call it contract brewing. Gosh. And so that was one of the options, but I thought, hey, I really want to learn how to do it all on my own. And so that's how we got started. And there was a tasting room. We could share equipment. It was really an awesome way to, to start sort of a business experiment. And um, not long after we got started, um, the, the owners of, of that winery and, and ranch, they, they were going to retire. Mm -hmm. And so the, the new owners invited us to stick around. Um, but at the same time, it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. And we thought, hey, let's go see what's going on in downtown Prescott. Mm -hmm. And so we were the first folks to sign a lease in the tasting room that you guys will visit later on. And my wife and I... Um, did much of the actual construction work, uh, like running a jackhammer, welding, painting, wallpaper, cove base, like building the bar. And we made a, a functional, you know, production winery or meadery in our case uh, with a tasting room. And I thought it would take three or four years to realize the potential of that space. It took three or four months. Yeah. We had 34 barrels in service in the office, under the stairs, everywhere. You know, fermenters like some of the which you see sitting behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that worked out great, but we saved up and we got uh, we bought this acre uh, that you guys are, are on right now. And we designed this production facility from scratch. So um, two SBA loans, one for equipment, one for this building uh, is what you guys are looking at right now. And we just applied Beautiful. for our next SBA loan. We'll see how that goes because um, we need more space for offices, cold storage, dry storage. Um, and uh, yeah. That's kind of how we got to here. That's awesome. I mean, you talk to people, and that's when they they open up like a brewery or a place like that. So they always say is that you always need what twice as much money as you think you're going to need, and a lot more space than what you ever think you're going to need. There's so many things you can't account for, right? No matter how much you read, you know, whatever the percent over you're going to like, you just you don't know until you get in it. And there's going to be bizarre things that you deal with with who's you know, your city or your county or whatever. Where you're just left field stuff. Can't see it coming, and it costs you money and right. time and all that. So yeah, there's um. The challenges uh, are are crazy. Um, it's really challenging. Uh, it keeps you up at night for sure. I mean, the whole entrepreneurial thing, like to to get to this point. Um, sometimes it might look easy from the outside, and we certainly try and portray just nothing but positivity because mm -hmm. things are very positive. But the oh, yeah. bit, like what is required to to grow a brand and to build a business, probably in any you know. Uh, category is it's incredible and you can't do it alone we've got some amazing staff um, from mead makers to our tasting room staff to sales it's really amazing what people have pu pulled together to make this happen and, oh yeah. Uh, yeah you guys are everywhere in the valley man it's awesome it's uh it's yeah we've, amazing to we've see. got um 100 and now 139 accounts in arizona as of yesterday so that's really exciting and it's yeah. super cool to be 
you know, we use Arizona honey as the primary fermentable sugar in every mead that we make. It's right. really awesome. And we use Arizona fruit and things like whenever we can. So it's great to be representing Arizona out there and, you know, it, it, within the state. And then, you know, we're, we're now um, throughout California as far as distribution goes. Uh, we just got into Georgia, Washington, D.C., wow. and we export to nine countries. Wow. Yeah, I've seen, you know, know the, the, you know, <laughs> keeping up with you guys just online and social media and news, you know, the, the sprawl of superstition has, has continued to grow. So is it, is it easier to expand now? Like is, is, you know, the, the city or township of Prescott, I'm sure they're a lot more open to give you like small business or loans. Sure. Cause I mean, superstition meadery isn't like a, oh, it's those guys in Prescott. I mean, you guys are well known in Arizona now. And now that you're growing out. Do you find it easier to get the support? I mean, Prescott's got to love you guys. I think that the support comes from the people that live in Prescott, right? That come into our tasting room and buy our products and come down and listen to live music on Friday and Saturday nights. I think that's where the support comes from. As far as the city goes, I think that, you know, they, they're, we, we know how to work um, within the system and, and they know us. And so I think like the next building, for example, will be a lot easier because we've learned all the lessons and we know what questions to ask. And um, there are people in the city that definitely have helped us out. So I think that that's really cool. Um, as far as the loan thing goes, that's um, sort of another world. And um, anyways, like we're, we're working with, uh, you know, a, a bank back east that specializes in one of their specialties is, is brewing and, and wineries. So that's really cool. And so I think that, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about the next loan, the fact that we've grown this brand, there's something that they refer to, in my understanding, as goodwill in the in the banking industry, and it actually means something, mm. which is kind of cool. And so at this point, you know, six years in, so we're at our six year anniversary is in uh, next month. So awesome. So yeah, it, it's cool. But you know, really, it comes down to like, what do the numbers look like? Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you can't you can't fake those. So, um, but we're we're reinvesting. You know, um, when you guys look around you, like this, everything, the fermenters, the barrels. You know, this stuff is state of the art, top of the line. Um, our bottling line back there from from Italy, our flip top closing machine that was custom made in Austria. Wow. You you can't get better That's equipment awesome. for what we're doing. And it means that the quality of the product is is always getting better. It means that we're able to to make more product to get into more places. You know, what it used to take us, you know, four people with our last bottling, it was like a forehead bottle filler, and it had, you know, argon gas and the quality was was great for what we could do. You know that machine cost about four grand. That bottling line cost 170. So we call that our Lamborghini because, and it's from <laughs> Italy. Um, but that can do um, with the same amount of people what that you know former product or whatever could do in like you know. So instead of four days, you're looking at six to eight hours, Holy cow. which is amazing. Yeah, nice. that is. Yeah. And and I mean it's rinsing, gassing, doing everything that you need it to do. Wow. That bottling line can uh, cork. It can crown cap in the case of our cider, or it can bypass the closures, and that's when we would manually apply a flip top. And so, with flip top bottles, it was a it was a hard decision as a company, not for me because I feel really strongly about the branding and, and using like that, you know, having the best possible packaging for everything that we do because of you know what's going in it deserves mm -hmm. it. And the real issue though is your thumbs. After like four cases, you're shot. Right. Right. And so. Right that flip top closing machine as fast as we can put bottles in it it's closing oh, man. so the machines work faster than, than we can feed nice. it need to see how that works that's awesome that's very cool so uh question two in the rapid yeah. round question <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah all right <laughs> yeah exactly all as works. you can see it doesn't go super fast that's cool uh what's the one thing that should never be in mead or craft beer it used to be a beer question but you know i guess speaking to you yeah either can, one beer either one yeah beer. that's a good question and if, even if you feel so strongly about any ingredient that shouldn't be in there Man, I so I don't I don't know if if I have a an exact never answer. Right I mean, on. there's some really funny stuff I guess you could say, but <laughs> yeah. For me personally, like we'll use um, mild uh, red hatch chilies in some of the products. Like we've used that for chili Ragnarok, which is mangoes, uh, and and chilies wound up being really awesome. Uh, Amante uh, is an awesome right. mead that we have, and we do a barrel aged version of that. And so you've got these adjuncts where there's cinnamon and cacao and coffee, and it's it's and so it it lends itself to that, right? And right. so you get this you know earthiness, you get this peppery flavor, but there's not the heat, right? And so for me. I've had like really hot, they call it a capsamel, right? Where you're using hot chilies or any chili, I guess, in a mead and beers with chilies. And for me, just personally, like I can appreciate it and I can be like, hey, this is technically well made or whatnot, but I'm never going to drink like, you know, eight ounces of like a super spicy 
you know, yes. chili meat. Right. For, so yeah. for me, like, you'll, you'll probably never see that come out chili of Superstation. Chili beer, chili meat, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I, I get it, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hate spicy beers with a passion myself, actually. Some are, <laughs> some are okay, when, like you said, it was just like the but flavors and stuff, but it was just heat for heat's sake. Stone's uh, Crime and Punishment series there, where they just made them to be as hot as possible. I was like, I just can't drink this. Yeah. I just can't do it. So, yeah. yeah. The first time I toured Stone, uh, Greg was putting chilies in barrels with gloves on. Really? It was kind of cool. <laughs> that yeah. is neat. So, yeah, he was cool. He did like the picture and all that, but yeah, yeah that was that was cool. So, yeah, and, and again, I can appreciate it and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I, yeah. I, I had friends who loved that beer, but I was just like, I can't drink that. I'm sorry. My, my how, how about you guys? What do, you, what do you think doesn't go in? Well, Jeff's got his uh, key... I always say my balls. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there you go. like you said, there's some funny answers. For yeah. You. <laughs> Definitely. I don't know. I, I don't remember. I don't feel like I ever give the same response anymore. Yeah. He like said, I'm, I'm pretty much open to anything except anything that's been. Well, that we talked about. Teabagged. Uh, well, there was. <laughs> you know the, what I'm talking about? Yeah. So there was like <laughs> Rocky Mountain Oysters was supposed to be in a beer. This one had that. There was uh, a supermodel's yeast. <laughs> from her vagina. And these are all real things. Real wow. things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That someone, was someone literally made a beer that was like fermented with yeah, like vaginal yeast. It's like that's disgusting. I'm, that's I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass every time wow. we tell that Gl- story. Glitter, like, glitter's one I saw too as well. That's should be another beer. Glitter, glitter awful. Beer, yeah. I just saw a glitter beer video someone sent me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't really believe it, but <laughs> I think it's real. Yeah. It's yeah. it's amazing the stuff. Well, they have like you know the the whole well. Besides the stuff we've already said, they have like, you know, the goat brains and Ugh. everyone's trying to like, you know, the, there's like oysters. It's like, nah, well, it's, I, it's, I think I'm good. I've had an oyster stout before really? that I think right. had oysters in it that was a little salty, but that it's, might taste like what your balls would do to, right. to yeah, a beer. So it's yeah. <laughs> oysters, balls. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's the mineral. Yeah. The mineral that adds to it. Yeah. Oh, well, people just actually the shells too. The shells just get added to it. But yeah, some people actually do the full oysters and you're like, no, right, a salty minerality. Ooh, there you go. Yeah. I don't know about Perfect. That. Yeah, there's, there's like, a name for I it. Like, anyways, I like my drinks. I like trying new things. But there's certain things where it's like, no, I, I think I'm good. Never trying that. Is there sea salt in this? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, right. no. 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 There's no, no. There's, there's no sea salt in that. Uh, the next one is, what is your favorite place to have uh, a meat or a craft beer? You want to yeah. go either way? Man, that's a. I mean, I like to say the tasting room. I mean, I go and hang out in it's there. Your tasting room. Yeah, that's it, gotta be nice. It's really cool. And have you guys been in there yet? Not yet. So um, we almost went in. We were d- downtown, but we were figured we'd wait. There's really something special about being in your own place yeah, and just sitting in a corner or whatever. Watching you know. people just enjoy your mead. It's awesome, man. I mean, and that is that's what you just said is I think really the best sort of reward and feedback that you get is when someone gets what you do and appreciates it and you see them enjoying it. And sometimes, you know, I've got my back to the room. I'm checking my email, whatever, and you just hear like conversations. Love and uh, yeah. It's yeah. it's really cool when people are digging it, you know. So you're like the there's under. No, yeah, there's no way that's not a cool moment. You like undercover boss your own place all the <laughs> yeah. time, is what you're saying. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. important. It's also cool to um to sit like in different chairs in the room and see like, oh, was that thing like taken care of or what? Like you just get a whole different perspective, right? You know, on what's going on in the room. And yeah, I love our place though. You know, it's um you know 115 year old plus 117 year old you know nice. building, and we wanted the the whole ambiance to be representative of. Uh, you know, like this feeling of Higa that you get when you go to uh, Northern Europe, you know, okay. in the Scandinavian countries where it's just chill and there's candles and um, there's no TVs, which, I mean, I love going and watching a game at the bar like yeah. everybody, but uh, people have conversations in our place. The acoustics are amazing for for live music. Nice. And uh, the wallpaper even is like a turn of the century design from last century, right, from England. And it's hexagons. There's uh, copper and turquoise represent it. There's wood that was, you know, brought on a train from the northwest to rebuild Prescott after the fire. Like we know the stories of yeah. the materials that made our place. That's so cool. Which is really cool. There's um the main wall that that you guys will see is my wife and I hand hewed Ponderosa pine boards that happen to be salvage wood from the Wallow Fire, which was the biggest fire in Arizona's history. And I was on that fire for two weeks. Wow. So we were like, you know, hewing out, you know, char marks on the boards wow. and stuff. We did custom stain with, uh, we put tea on the, into the Ponderosa pine wood, like with okay. a brush or sponge. And that put tannin into the wood that wasn't really there. And then you take steel wool and vinegar, and then you let that set for a few days and you put that on and it oxidizes the wood. So it's this gray harbor wood look. Nice. And so, Everything in there is like the kind of materials that you would be able to use yeah. 
like at the time they built the building. And so I think you'll get it when you, and there's truth yeah. windows to the past where there's like brick and old board form That's concrete cool. and stuff. So That's amazing. So we're, done now, we're, we're, love we're done now, guys. Passion. We're done. We should go. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sold. To the tasting room. Well, you guys have some empty glasses. So, hey, we you pulled know, some nails right when we were setting up. Do you yeah. guys want to try something else? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. cool. Sounds good. All right. So what we've got here is some piment. So piment is when you ferment wine grapes and... All right, one, two, three. Oh my goodness. There we go. I'll steal one of those. Uh, wine grapes with honey. And so we used, in, in this case, this is uh, Cabernet grapes from California, Arizona wildflower honey. And this is in a new uh, medium plus toast uh, American oak barrel. Nice. It's that smell, was made with it Missouri. It smells incredible. We need, we need to do like smell a vision <laughs> yeah, on this. Right. It's, man, that's awesome. Holy so shit. that went in in about October, and we'll probably pull it out this summer. Wow. And we'll do, um, we have a Syrah uh, grapes with mesquite hunting. We've got our cat with wildflower. We'll do some blends of those. Um, yeah, it's really cool. We've done um, uh, one of our guild bottles that came out recently. It guilds our, like our wine club or beer yeah. club. We did Saturnalia, and so we had some friends from Sweden come over, and they wanted to make a meat with us. And uh, we, we put cherries, sweet cherries, tart cherries, um, nice. you know, with uh Zinfandel grape juice, and we wow. ferment that all together, and and really so yeah, wine grapes Dang. and certain other fruits. And you think about cooking, you think about like wine descriptions, right? Like people mm -hmm. are always saying like, dark fruit is like coming from this Pinot or whatever. So it's kind of cool to think like, well, let's just add dark fruit to the wine grapes and see what happens, and it turned out yeah. awesome. It has like a, it's like sweet up front, but it has kind of a Chardonnay dry kind yeah. of, well, not it's dry, but you know that Cabernet. That thing's really good. That's, I love that. That's awesome. The alcohol balances the sugar, and and yeah. you're and you're getting tannin from the wood in the finish, right? That's probably and it just lingers. So one of the one of the things that I think defines a great beverage, a great meal, is you know you're going to get a diversity of flavor, but then that finish, like when you're done that bite, like right now I'm talking and I'm exhaling and I'm still getting like right. the grapes, the dark fruit. I mean, there's I think the honey in the beginning, but yeah. then then it winds up finishing like a late harvest wine would be like, you know? Right. That's good. Yeah, it's crazy because I mean, it's awesome, it's, it's it's very sweet up front, but it, it's I mean, as sweet as it is with the honey, it, it's not like cloying. It, I mean, it's not like brutally sweet. It it balances out. It's very, yeah, extremely well. Very good. The great thing about sweetness, and and on average, I would say we shoot for semi sweet, at least from like a mead judge perspective, and what we do, it allows things like vanilla or cherries or blackberries to really shine, right? And I learned that when I was first making wine back at Juniper Wall Ranch, and the first time. You know, we had this, you know, the, the wine grapes show up, right? And we're putting them in the crusher to stemmer. And I was eating the fruit and it was kind of a pain in the butt because wine grapes are like kind of small and there's seeds and stuff, you know, so you're like spinning the seeds out. But the flavor of the fruit was so good. And like, I love like great tropical fruit and stuff, right? It was the best fruit I'd ever had. And I was thinking, why doesn't wine taste like that good? Like, and then I started to learn about ports and late harvest wines. And I started, you know, and I was of course making meat at the time. And so sometimes we'll have something that say ferments super dry. And then we'll add a little bit of honey to it, like in a bench trial, and it just makes the flavors pop. And then, you know, we'll figure out what that ratio has to be to make it how we want it to, to be in the final product version. Cool. That's extremely cool. So I guess the last <clears throat> last question I have in the rapid round, and we maybe take a break. Yeah. Uh, break. Is basically, normally it's what do you think the next big trend in craft beer is? But I think you guys stumble upon it, which is basically putting meat into craft beer. Like, sorry, putting craft beer into meat barrels. Because I, I think that that's really cool. And I, I mean, mead still really is so small, right? So I don't know if that's going to be like a giant trend, but it's definitely happening. It's not just us doing it and, anymore. And, uh, you know, Draft Magazine did a, did a cool article you guys may have seen on that. And so working with, you know, Ren House, Bottle say, Logic, Black Keller Canyon. San Diego. And yeah, their Black Canyon bottle. I'm looking forward to picking that up. I just opened one the other day. They, they were here <laughs> well, yesterday. Were they? So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I saw that on Instagram. That's right. Yeah. Well, that we did the, I know the that hundred whole, ingredient, the, the Who Hit John Grand Crew. Right. That they, you know, stored in your barrels. And it was a thing where, you know, is like when we first started branching out into, you know, from doing kind of like our own little, you know, let's drink beer and talk about it to branching out to talking to breweries. Ren House was the, the second brewery, well, third brewery we actually did. And, you know, they were telling us about this who hit John Grand Crew. And, you know, how it was, you know, all getting poured into superstition meadery barrels. And then a year, year and a half afterwards, you know, drew over it super or uh Ren House is like hey i got this bottle for you guys and it was it was that you know the who hit john grand crew and i think we were all pretty much blown away and i mean the complexity but you know still you you kind of get that it's the meatiness is there but you know with all of the other things and that it just came out super incredible 
Right on. Yeah, no, that's a lot of fun to do that. The, the barrel exchange program that we we do, and you know, we first started with Arizona Wilderness, you know, and they yeah. you know, we did a collab, and they, you know, we sent a barrel down there, and then we got it back, and we put a meat in it, and uh, you know, the first time we were at the Copenhagen Beer Celebration, now it's NBCC, but we're across from from Wilderness, and you know, we've got a mead that aged in one of their barrels, and they've got a beer that aged in a mead nice. barrel, and. You know, we get to send the people back. We we made it the same session, right? So you're sending people back that's and forth. Cool. It was beautiful. I mean, that's, that's, awesome. that's I mean the stories, right? You got to have cool stories to have right. a oh, cool yeah. business, cool brand. Oh yeah, and and that's what I guess I've always really loved is creating stories, telling stories. Um, and so thanks for letting me hang out with oh, you guys and yeah. tell our story today. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, so I, we we've been dying to do this since we started. Yeah. You were you were, the superstition metery was the bucket list for one on our show. Honestly. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that means a lot. Um. Since you brought up barrels, uh, you guys just got five or six barrels from Pure Project, right? Yeah, so they're uh, right behind you guys to the left of that uh, that oh, red okay. banner. So, oh, they've already uh, been have they been filled at this point? Yeah, so um, we we took um, Safe Word, right, which right. is like a Belgian dark strong bean that we make, mm-hmm. and so there's uh, Arizona honey, Belgian dark candy sugar, and we put that in those barrels, and we're going to figure out what to do next, but. We always want to fill barrels as fast as we can, uh, and we happen to have that mead ready to go in there. And I think that because you know those were um, you I was know, say, maple well, bourbon barrels that made a stout, so it's going to lend itself nicely to the, to that flavor profile. What is that uh, what is that maple bourbon stout? It wasn't a nine nine by any chance. Do you happen to know what, what came out of those I, barrels? I I don't know the okay, the no name problem. of the beer. No problem. Yeah, they gave me a description. Yeah. but All right. I'd have to look I that th- up. And they think they just released a maple stout to their bottles uh, on bottles too. So I'm sure well, that's probably it because the barrels say, just got racked. So yeah, I'm sure it was. And that's very cool. That's yeah. Very so cool. we're actually psyched. Those guys are talking about coming out um, before awesome. Barry White Day, which is oh. our big event of the year. It's yes. usually it's November 10th. Actually, this is the first official announcement. So perfect. Yeah, we just locked in our space. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna take what's in those barrels and and do something special Dang. with Pure Project. So see that'll be really then. cool. Yeah. Yeah. See you then. All right. Yeah. Let's take a quick break, real quick, uh, and uh, be right back. All right, we are back. So, uh, uh, next round of questioning. What, what questions do we have? You guys got questions? I got. Well, a, I got a ton. Well, we just where we left off last. I was curious. You had said um, when you were starting out, you weren't sure if it was mead or, or beer yet. When did you make that decision, and kind of how did you? You're just like, all right, it's mead. Yeah. So Wait, you know, I think with oh, any. Hold on, before you get into that. What Chris, is, I can't. What, oh, go ahead. What is a person? Oh, yeah. Before you get into that, there we go. What is a person that actually? So when you when you do craft beer, you're a brewer. Is it meatist, meatery, or so you're a mead maker? So now in, okay. in wine making, you can be a vintner. Right. You can okay. be a winemaker. Now there's a word maser, right? Like the maser cups, the big competition that yes, you know everyone attends and enters or whatnot around the world, which is awesome. So, uh, anyways, there are people that use the term maser to describe someone that makes mead, but technically it's it's like a bowl shaped serving vessel okay. that that you would serve mead or alcohol in from like medieval times. Okay, gotcha. So um. There are people that have come to use the word maser, but um, but really you're a mead maker. Okay, so well, perfect. Like meatist. You had to get the like you, you want to make cool. sure we ask that question. Yeah, yeah, well, it was really top of my list. I was like, what? <laughs> what? No, you... Stop talking. Well, I kept having to like <laughs> replace brewer with. I was like, what the hell do I put in here? Me- meter. Me- meterist. Meter. Meter. Although, so you know how they have sommeliers and now cicerones. Right. Okay. So we, our guys, made up a word, the mazeroni. Mazeroni. So, <laughs> so we may start Mazeroni. the Mazeroni program. There you go. Perfect. So one day you'll be in a nice restaurant in LA, and they'll be like, "Would you like to speak with the Mazeroni for a pairing suggestion?" <laughs> Perfect. Yes, yes. please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Please. Bring him over. So, so yeah, I just uh, you had, you had mentioned uh, when you were starting, you weren't sure yet which way it was going. Yeah, I, I think with any real critical decision as a business owner or someone starting a business, you got to do a pro-con list. And yeah. so some of the pro items, uh, you know, for starting a meadery was, you know, it's unknown. It's also like right over next to it in the con item because how are you going to sell something no one knows about, right? Mm-hmm. So that's always our biggest challenge, right? It's no one knows what it is. And number two, it's really expensive to make, which means it's an expensive product to sell. And so there's a lot of education that goes into that. And so I knew that going in, but I thought that there was you know, with risk, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I made that decision was let's, let's do mead. Let's figure it out. Plus at the time there was that opportunity to start uh, very small. Our first year we made 300 gallons. Wow. Yeah. Six years ago. So that was like what we wrote a check for our taxes to the feds and the state. And it was in last, in last year, over 29,000 and we became the largest winery in Arizona and we don't make wine. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. We actually just found that out two weeks ago. Really? So. Yeah, cool. there was a, a hiccup with the reporting with the state, and they're like, you guys didn't, you know, turn in your thing. And we're like, oh, no, we did. And so we went back, and, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, what, 
we got you. <laughs> and I said, oh, by the way, I think we're getting near, you know, the top of this whole thing from, like, I asked for the numbers from the year before. And, it, yeah, it turned out by, you know, about seven or 800 gallons, um, we were wow. the, the biggest winery in Arizona for production in 2017. So we're really proud of that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. Only, I was just curious about that. So you weigh, you weigh mead versus beer, and then you go the mead direction, and then you guys make crazy ciders like this blueberry spaceship box. At what point are you like, hey, let's, you know, I, I want to make a cider. What's part of that? I, I mean, what does that decision-making process look like? Because, again, you know, blueberry spaceship box isn't like, oh, yeah, these, these guys, you know. We we just decided to dabble in cider. I mean, you, you guys are killing it with this. this Best is cider a, in the this world, is amazing right? stuff. It really, it really, I mean, and, and it's fair. Well, I think it's a fair, uh, fair thing to say. But I'm not surprised. But yeah, so um, I made ciders, you know, as a home brewer as well, and what it went in a gold medal um, for one of the ciders I made, which was kind of cool. So I thought, hey, might as well make cider. We're allowed to with our license. Really? So okay. um, your listeners may know this or may not, but in America, there's three types of alcohol producers. So you can be a brewery, a winery, or a distillery. So brewery uh, uses cereal grains and has to use cereal grains in about 51% of what they do for fermentable sugars, right? A winery is not allowed to use cereal grains at all. Okay. A distillery can use whatever they want, but they have to distill it. So, you know, they could make wine gotcha. and make it brandy or cognac style, right? But right. Ultimately, it's a distilled product. Now, there's ways to stack licenses and get creative, right? But generally, that's how things break down. And so that's kind of how we figured that out, right? So we can make cider, right? Very so like, let's, let's do, we did cider right from the beginning. We did bourbon barrel aged cider, fermented cider. Wow. Um, we started doing fruit ciders. That's what we call a cider when we add something besides apples, right? I mean, mm-hmm. What else do you call it, right? Fruit right. cider. Right. So this is a, a happens to you know have blueberry juice that we add in the end of fermentation as well to really retain the character of the blueberry. And so you're looking at this, you know, crazy purple beverage that you can taste that like granny smith tannin but you can taste blueberries and it looks like blueberries are in it and so it it's like some of the things we do are really like crazy fruit forward in your face like there's you don't have to use your imagination at all to know what's in there right some things we do are really subtle and balanced but we thought there are so many excellent cider producers out there you know from virtue cider and and you know Julian, and even, you know, I, I love the Woodchuck and Crispin stuff that was kind of all you could get back when I first started, you know, doing the business thing. And, and they make great stuff. And then there's, you know, we, we try the, you know, ciders from France and Cedar from Spain and like went to Spain and tried cider in Astorius. And we're like, you know, we, we we're like, hey, this stuff is great. What can we do that's different? Mm-hmm. Let's do fruit ciders. Let's take something that tastes like apples and is made from apples, right? But let's let's add other things. Let's add vanilla beans. Let's add blueberry juice, cherry juice, peach juice, apricot juice, and do different something else mm-hmm. to stand out, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of what we do with mead as well. I mean, there's you can there's comparisons you can make with anyone, right? Different yeah, producers, right. but I think we have our own style for sure, oh, and yeah. um, and it's really like our range is is huge. We we don't. Uh, discriminate as far as like ingredients or barrels like we'll use you know any different you know technique we can learn about in order to make something different better um at the same time we really respect traditions and so we do some traditional cider and we're actually looking at uh doing principia a traditional cider in cans we have a really cool label oh, already nice. which will be fun um and then same with like traditional meads we do like if we can get which is every once in a while some really cool honey like ironwood honey from the bee dudes um will make just a traditional mead, which is just honey. There's nothing else in there. And I think that's kind of like, you know, a lager or a pilsner for a brewer where, you right. know, depending on your style, like there's nowhere to hide, yeah. right? You got to yeah. make it perfect and you got to like showcase that terroir of that honey, which is something mm-hmm. we love to do. Same thing with whole fruit. We've got an awesome fruit press out in our, our, our storage unit out there. Mm-hmm. We just, you know, we're, we're pressing uh, cherries and, and blackberries with Arizona Wilderness. And that's going to become the first product in our French oak barrel aging project. Nice. So. So that's been a lot of fun. But yeah, so back to Cider Man, like, I love this. I love drinking it. And it's really amazing that, that you know, by going to festivals and now, like, we've been bottling this since October. It's gone across the country and around the world to our accounts and, and people dig it. And it is really so different and fun to drink. And um, we're working on uh, two new uh, ciders coming out before the end of the year that'll be also in screen printed bottles, just like Blueberry Spaceship Box. Nice. So it's amazing. We got we have we have friends in the Pacific Northwest that have heard about it and like, hey, how how do I get my hands on a bottle of this stuff? And we're like, well, we're we're waiting. It comes out, you know, fairly regularly. Luckily for us, you can go to us, you know, you can go to GCM or some right. other place and get it. We're pretty Water lucky. Tortoise, you can go there for sure. Were yeah. you uh, were you surprised uh, after it's a, just at the response to it? I mean, uh, or do you guys uh, the, know it was good? So we knew it was good, right? 
and we've always, I think like a lot of folks in, in the brewing world, you make what you want to drink, right? Right. And you want to drink good stuff. sitting right there. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think the surprise was how people took to, because it was unpredictable. Yeah. So it's the definition of a surprise, right? It's like, how is superstition going to be received at the best international craft beverage, craft beer festivals in the world? And we've been really well received. And part of it is, I think, you know, it, it really is different. And especially at the end of like four hours of drinking crazy sours and stouts yeah. and things that are delicious. And I, my house is full of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, sometimes when you get something like blueberry spaceship box, or you get what we're about to open here, you know, a strawberry white, it's really kind of cool. And it's a great, like positive sort of contrasting flavor comparison to, to what you've got going on, you know, in the beer world. Yeah. And I think that because of home brewing, that's one of my hypotheses as far as like why craft beer fans have, have taken on to me because, you know, I mean, I don't know how many, you know, tens of thousands of folks are in members of the American Homebrew Association, but you know, everyone in there knows what meat is. And at least one of their friends has made one. Yeah. Well, and, uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say yeah. is, you know, that it's, it's, Looking from the you know, the outside in, you, you see that you guys you go to Jay Wakefield, you go to these different events. We you showed us board earlier. You know, a lot of the things you're doing, like collab wise and other stuff. Is it is it really that? I mean, how cool is that? Actually, the the craft beer community actually is in, like invited you guys in. It's, I mean, that's it's kind of crazy. It's oh, amazing. Yeah. It's Open humbling. Arms, it it's an like. it's an honor. It's I, I I mean again, that's a surprise. I never could have predicted that. You talk to any brewer in the valley, and they just tell you how lucky we are to even have you guys yeah. in the state. It and. And I feel like there's a responsibility that we've we've taken on as, you know, being one of, you know, several like and we're friends like the Arizona Wilderness Ren Houses. And, yeah. you know, there's lots of great folks in southern Arizona coming up and people in Flagstaff that are doing great things for Arizona and the craft scene and even the wine scenes doing doing awesome, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, to be part of that and to be to have become um an industry leader and 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 right. and part of like a statewide leader and in, in, in helping make the craft scene what it is 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 awesome people travel to prescott now from other yeah. countries to drink our stuff yeah. and you know for barry white day we did events at park plaza liquor deli the raven granite mountain brewing those were our first three accounts and so we made sure that each one of those places had something no one had ever had before over and so we made it over four days and so people have reasons to come to town and stay in hotels and go out to eat to the restaurants like you know barley how where they they have a cocktail with our meat in it. and yeah. and so to be part of making prescott part of the arizona scene that's that's been really fun too yeah that is very cool so you know i want to back up a little bit so and most of our listeners are probably are more crappier drinkers but they know mead and understand what it tastes like hand and stuff hand. yeah yeah a little bit what's Comparison wise, what's the difference between brewing a mead versus brewing a beer? Like, what are the what are, yeah. what's the differences really? There, there, there are several. Um, the first one is we don't use heat, right? Okay. So once honey gets over 100 degrees, it starts to lose some of the volatile aromatic compounds and you know the flavor things that you would want to have in there. And you know, like wine making, where we use sulfites, we use sulfites uh, less than than in wine making goes, but we still are able to do that, which is which is a benefit for us for for um, fighting oxidation and you know any sort of like microbes and for for aging as well, color retention. So um, so that's that's different. Like brewers aren't using sulfites, right? Right. Um, and in order to get the fermentable sugar to to work with yeast from honey, all you have to do is dilute the honey. So when bees make honey, not to get into the birds and the bees, <laughs> but they're going to go get nectar and there's enzymes in in their honey sack and they you know put it into the you know the hive into their cell and then they actually like flap their wings to dry out the moisture content to get below 18 percent and they know that wild yeast and bacteria won't allow that to ferment. It becomes stabilized. We reverse that process by adding water or fruit juice. And so that sugar molecule is in a state that's ready to be fermented when it meets, you know, the commercial yeast that we use. So um, in brewing, you know, of course you have to mash and, and, you know, you have to convert the sugars in order to first ferment them. So we don't, we don't have to use heat, which is really cool. So everything has to be super clean and sanitized. So it's like cold side brewing right. the whole time. So, you know, we're super, oh, wow. you know, anal about that with all the equipment and everything that we use. Yeah. The other thing that's a, a big difference, I think, is the fermentation process. So while I know that, especially for really high gravity beers, certain breweries will use some of these techniques and, and so will wineries, but we're gonna add nutrients, we're gonna degas, we're gonna add oxygen during the fermentation process. And our goal is to have the yeast be as happy and healthy as possible so that when the fermentation is over, 
you haven't created all flavors because the yeast haven't been stressed. And then we're going to rack, which means pumping off of the you know the leaves, the dead yeast cells as soon as we can, right? And uh, you know once the the yeast cells you know die, there's all told this is where there's you know potentially going to release some all flavors that you know is a byproduct of you know that chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the theory, anyways. Some people may say that that's not real, but we've um, come to learn from practice that it sure seems to be a thing that is is real. Yeah. And so we're we're doing early racking as well. Um, and then the idea is that you've created this this mead, you know, and we use the same process for a cider. We can make cider in a couple of days, um, not literally the whole process, yeah. right? But we can finish a fermentation in a couple of right. days and, and have it taste good. Um, there's always a little bit of aging that benefits things. Um, and then I think where the you know similarities come into play is like what kind of flavors are you going to use? How are you going to you know do your barrel aging and stuff? So very cool, yeah. nice. So you guys use all local Arizona honey. Yes. Uh, ingredients from Arizona, like you said earlier, from here and then up from all over the place, too, as well. Yeah, so I always thought it'd be cool to pair the best international ingredients with Arizona honey. So we used, you know, vanilla beans from Tahiti, the most expensive you can get, right? Um, and then, of course, Madagascar bourbon vanilla beans are great. You know, lots of people use those in, in stouts. And, um, you know, we use Spanish saffron and, you know, different ingredients from all over the world. But the Arizona honey really is special to us. And um, behind you guys, you can see this uh, this cool pirate flag where we... You yeah, know. Chris is liking that. Yeah, yeah, we need to get in that at, at, at some point. Chris here. wants right, to talk cool. deep Chris, into it. Chris but. definitely wants to talk about <clears throat> that. Yeah. All right. Um, I one thing I want to talk to you about, and maybe, and we may get, uh, go on with this bottle. But uh, Barry White Day, one of your special events. Yeah, yeah. When, let's let's open the strawberry white yeah. as we're talking. And yeah, I was just going to ask oh, you. Okay. <laughs> how did you get that going? How did that? You know, when did that? When did you realize that was? Well, really, what something you guys would be what, doing? What is Barry White Day? Yeah, and and Basically. kind of you know. So, guys, I'm just giving you a splash here, but really help yourself. So, this is batch one of strawberry white. Oh, my gosh. And it's We're coming so out of lucky. this white ceramic flip top bottle. This is really special. It so. looks really fucking cool. Oh. And it smells God. amazing. Yeah, loving that bottle. But so, you oh, know, man. And, and All right, so, Barry, yes, about Barry White. Barry White. So, and side note, real quick. Um, we actually, Nate and I actually stood in a line in California for uh, a beer release one time. And we were standing in line, and there's probably like 500 people. And the one person that actually walked up behind us and got in line was wearing one of your guys' hats. That's awesome. And we're like, How, we, what? Okay, that's cool. Like, and that's one of the things that, you know, it was just one of the, it's, it's always funny because it's like, that's, that's our homestead. That's freaking really rad that somebody that, in that California cool. <laughs> has right. beer, that's into beer. Like, we, we are, you know, two years are too. So, wow. So that's four years old right now. I mean, from birth to, to drink. I can it. have more, by the way. That's oh, all right. No, no, please help yourself. <laughs> yeah. Please. It's like, wait a minute. I was going to say, Chris and I aren't strangers to the whole oh, Barry God, White thing. I, I bought a couple bottles for a bottle share that we did. And it's funny, I, I, I made sure. Yeah, you know, some of my fridge. I just, I just bought them, and I picked them up at GCM down in you know the valley. Oh, yeah. And we were going to a bottle share, and I had to kind of prep my wife when I got there. It's like, she's not going to know. You know, I'm not going to say anything. But then, you know, we go around the 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 people who are in the know and it's like there's a very high potential of someone saying i can't believe you you spent that much money on these bottles <laughs> and so i'm telling my wife we you know we're on our way to pine this bottle share it's like i'm just gonna tell you right now that this is what i spent on these bottles but they're so incredible <laughs> and so my wife tried them and she's like yeah it's totally worth it it it, it is expensive <laughs> um you know there's not necessarily more honey than some of our other other products yeah. but um you know we have a, um, a top secret uh, white chocolate ingredient that we use. There's a ton of vanilla beans. We just spent sixteen thousand dollars on new barrels that'll be here in a couple of weeks from California to age this year's oh white God, series man. in it. So we just nuts. we spare no expense in making this product, and I'm I think my it's mind over here. just it's, awesome as far as you know something that would be a, a decadent uh, dessert wine, right? If it's, it's Toberlones, just blink twice. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. No, it's, okay. it's not. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's, it's incredible not, stuff. It's absolutely, we're trying, we're trying to mind. try to guess the, really, the really, secret really chocolate good. ingredient now. That's what I'm trying. It's to one of our only secrets. So it's it, it it's yeah. What what are you gonna say? This stuff is absolutely incredible. That's nuts. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Holy yeah. cow! No, it's it's fun for me to have a cool excuse to open something old. Like I mean, normally I would, you know just stare at it walking by once in a while. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's awesome. Tuesday. Mm, no. There yeah. you go. No, no. Holy cow! It just uh, str smells like strawberry jam, man. It really smells does. so good. It's neat to see how, how things age as well, right? I mean, there aren't too many things we have older than that that we've made as a company. Really? So that's really yeah, cool really, to try. You said six years old, so that's four years old. Yeah. So that's, that's some early on planning type shit where you're like, we're going to save some of this and then put it in some barrels and do some magic with it. Yeah, I think that's we awesome. started that fermentation in the, uh, December 2013, if memory serves right. And so we bought it in 2015. And yeah. So we, we great name. 
Uh, what is Barry White Day for yeah. everybody that does not know what yeah, it is so, yeah, um, all about? So the first uh, gold medal that we ever won at the Mazer Cup, which is the world's largest commercial mead competition, was for Barry White. And so it's a you know, raspberry white chocolate barrel aged mead that we made. And we, we since have had some other variants come out with other fruit flavors. So, um, and, and we're probably not going to make any more at this point. We, we're really happy with, with where it is. But every year we celebrate that. Yeah. And so it, it turns out that this year it's November 10th, and uh, we've rented an amazing space um, above the Elks Theater in Prescott, which we've never used before. So if you guys have been to our events before, if you're listening, um, it's a brand new space that is gorgeous. View over the mountains of Prescott, and there's an outdoor area to hang out. We're going to have live music and food. Well, Barry White Day is a time where if you can, you know, we'll pre-sell bottles like on Eventbrite or Brown Picker tickets or whatever, and you'll be able to come here and have tours of our facility coffee we have live music we had you know like a stand-up bass and a keyboardist last time and so you come pick up your stuff here we'll have events going on um, around town in our tasting room but the actual berry white day event is where you know for four hours we we rent this space and we we put on a great spread a great show and you can come and try not just the white series but we always have special one-off things coming out that day and it's um one of the few you know, craft beverage events of its kind in the world. And the other thing that's really kind of fun is last year we did a month after our Barry White Day, an event in Hong Kong and an event at McKellar Aarhus in Denmark. And so we had Barry White Day Europe and Barry White wow. Day Asia. And so that reminds me, I need to send some emails and see uh, what other <laughs> cities we can we can set up, you know. So um, there's people, I mean, in a very small, humble way, but yeah. but again, celebrating with us around the world. Yeah. You know, like Even some of the best s- meat. If you're sending five gallons of that, I mean, gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. So Do you get any love or inquiries from like, you know, Sweden, Norway, like the the, the big Scandinavian countries? We, we do. And, and you know, what we've found, and so we actually um, recently started exporting to Norway and Sweden, which is pretty cool. That's, that's I mean, again, you know, that, that, that's that got to be like, that. you got to get super pumped at that. Because, I mean, you figure, you know, here, here are the Scandinavians where, where basically, you know, mead was where it comes from. And, you know, they're hitting you up for your mead. And, and that kind of takes us back. You know, the first time I had mead, I think it was at Papago, and they had... I can't remember what it was, but it was one of the more popular meads and blue label you know. has a blue label on it. No, it's not. It was. Nope. It was. It 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 really was bad. like it was like a white clay pot. Okay. With like kind of like a wicker basket. Oh, around I, it. I think it's a Polish mead. Yeah, and it comes okay. with like a little bag of spices, which I never used. Mm. And but that was that was my first introduction to mead, and so yeah, it's it's just got to be a charge, to you guys. When when Scandinavians are hitting you up and be like, hey, yeah, your your, I mean, your mead's awesome. How do we get it? It, it is cool. And you know what I've learned over there from talking to folks that are that are from those countries, everyone there kind of knows what meat is from you know, hearing about it. But I don't think there's a single meadery in Finland. We're friends and we're doing a collab this summer with the first meadery that just opened in Norway. Okay. And there's a couple of meaderies in Sweden, but but very few. And so as as a whole, the 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 craft community over there, they may be aware of mead, but they don't have access to it and they don't have domestic producers like we do in America. There's now over 500 meteries. That's crazy. Yeah. So you think you think it would be the opposite. It's really. So yeah. another thing I learned in Europe is, you know, the and obviously you can point to tons of producers that have really cool lineups of, of amazing craft beers. Right. But, you know, America kind of like led that movement and and those guys are they've really picked it up and meads the same thing where if you know you are from from you know most european countries you've had a mead it was probably a traditional sweet mead and it wasn't something like what you know our style is and so i think it is fun when you see folks and they're trying you know like i just showed you guys like we're making you know this mead war honey and there's there's lemon peels and there's hops and it's circulating and, and the then coolest they get to, hot back i've ever seen yeah you get <laughs> right. to try that like in in sweden right and you're like hey that's we've never thought about Something like bad. that combination but it's a great bridge right because people like that drink craft beer are like oh i know what hops are i've had citrus ipa so mm-hmm. i'll try that and so um there's a little method to the madness there too and and you know how we make some of the meads because that's a really cool reason uh you know to get someone to try something new and then yeah. they're like oh yeah well it tastes good and especially if you try a bunch of different things like our best accounts they always offer mead by the flight right like right the people that like if you guys been to the wandering toys oh, yeah. for example it's yeah, awesome we, we, we recorded it a couple guys. times yeah yeah love justin evans and all those guys yeah yeah, Justin's great, and that's so cool when when you when folks can try a flight because yeah. you can for the price of one glass of wine you can try four or five things right. and you're like something's gonna click. Yeah, absolutely. What I was gonna say is there, there's people like when I talk to and I tell them it's like oh it's mead and they're like well, what's mead and it's like it's fermented honey and they're like oh that seems really sweet like my wife's not a big like things are way too sweet 
especially ciders and stuff. She's not a big fan of them. So like when you earlier you're talking about, you're like, Oh, well you guys don't you more on the, you know, there's dry, there's actually semi-sweet. There's, there's actually different ranges of actually that kind of, of actually meat itself. There's more actually than what actually is there for people to try. Right. Right. It's super nice. And see, my wife's just the opposite. It's like, Hey, <laughs> yeah, this, know, right? is, this is me. And she's like, Oh, I don't know about that. And it's like, it's, it's, you know, the Tahitian honeymoon. It's like, it's good. It's vanilla. It's delicious. Taste it. And she's like, Oh yeah, that's amazing. Right. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. So it it's no obviously it's mead. So you know, honey is is big on the bill of of you know the ingredients you have to buy. So it's also no secret to anyone that I mean that bees um, colony collapses. You know, bees dying off is a big thing. Do you do anything to support or invest in you know the 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 bee health or the longevity of bees in Arizona? So we we have six hives down the hill from from where we're sitting right now, and so we've we've worked with a local Arizona beekeeper to learn about beekeeping, and I've learned about some of the issues, right? And so we also will buy honey from local beekeepers that are using things like garlic and essential oils instead of antibiotics on their bees. But the reality is, commercial beekeeping is is a huge business, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys may have seen documentaries about this, and some of the issues are so they move the bees around, which can cause stress, right? Mm -hmm. And then Maybe one pesticide that's on one floral source is, isn't going to affect them. But if they go to two or three of those and it's two or three different pesticides, that's one thing that science thinks is, you know, creating that sort of perfect storm of, you know, really affecting their, you know, immune system and whatnot, right? And then there's varroa mites and there's, you know, other issues with, um, you know, interbreeding of the bees and whatnot. I can't affect that. And, and really... I don't know how many people can because that's like federal level legislation. And how do you say to someone that makes money as a commercial beekeeper, you can't go here, you can't go there, or how do you make the the farmers use the same or different pesticides that may not work? And then so it's it's really a a challenging uh, you know problem that that everyone's facing. Um, and so it's good to be aware of it, and it's good to support local beekeepers whenever you can, which means you're going to pay more for honey uh, when that happens. And we're, we're happy to do that. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, supporting like the, the calls, like I, I don't know exactly how we could do anything more than actually buying honey. Well, that's very cool. Which you guys means have that, hives just down the hill. Those yeah. are yours. You guys did that yourselves? We did. Yeah. That's very cool. But, but I think as a business that uses honey as our, our major raw ingredient, we're supporting people that make honey, people that raise bees, and and even the commercial beekeepers, they want to solve the problems as well, right? And so I know that we've bought honey from commercial beekeepers that, again, they're using like garlic and essential oils yeah. and things and trying to find more natural ways of, you know, preventing some of those issues and keeping the bees healthy. So, so yeah, whenever we have a chance to work with those folks, but in general, I think when you, when you buy mead and when we buy honey to make the mead, you are sort of, you know, by default, participating in being part of that solution in a way versus being part of the problem. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. And I think where, where really the rubber meets the road is it makes honey more expensive because of what the, the honey producers have to really go through in order to replenish the bee populations that allow them to, to have a business. And so, yeah, it doesn't make it uh, you know cheaper to make, unfortunately, with that whole that whole process. But it's interesting you guys try and spend your money as responsibly as possible with that in, in that regard. So. We do. And 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 again, using local honey and and buying only we, we've never bought honey outside Arizona. So that's really important too. So we're supporting our yeah. local economy, our state economy, and the beekeepers in Arizona. So that's right. that's important to us. Yeah. So and, and again, you know, it's like like part of that, you know, I I amateur garden, you know, I and you know, you you want bees in your yard. You want amateur you want, garden. You want bees doing you know, their, their job in your yard. So as a meadery, that's such a bigger scale than it's like, oh, I want my jalapenos to grow or whatever. And you know, we're staring at a pallet of what is that, like five 50-gallon barrels of honey. And you know, the, the, the whole colony collapse, bees dying off thing has, has got to concern you a lot more than someone like me who's, you know, trying to grow a couple vegetables in his backyard. Yeah, it's something that we we pay attention to. And I've, you know, talked to beekeepers and, and watch shows. Um, but bees are still, you know, doing what bees do and yeah. re reproducing and, and, and making honey. Um, but it it definitely stinks when, you know, you're talking to someone and they're like, yeah, half our hives are gone and you know, that didn't used to happen. Right. So, so I was going to say is uh, 
Is that how your mead comes? Because I thought it came in maybe like a big giant milk truck full of honey, and then they just kind of like pumped it out. It's always coming like the fifty gallon barrels like this. We so almost all of our, milk our truck honey. Full of honey. <laughs> that, I, mean, I won't be here that day when that actually happens. They, they do, no, they do, do, they that. do that. Do they do that? Yeah, and they use they use right, toads. I'm the you know, like Shut up, gallon toads. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So most of our honey now comes in fifty five gallon drums. Okay. Um, if we get a smaller varietal of honey, then it'll mm. still come in a five gallon bucket. Okay. okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, you home brewed. For years before you started this, you probably honed some of the recipes for your flagship meads in that process. Absolutely. What were some of those? And you know, uh, especially like Marion, I imagine had to be in, in that around that list. Yeah, Marion was, and uh, Tahitian uh, honeymoon. So okay. our vanilla mead was something that I always you know made back in the day. And uh, I always, like I said, I used to make maple meads, and so we've done some different versions of that, and even use maple syrup in different ways. So that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, alm was something I made early on, where right. um, we use uh, Spanish saffron and coriander and hops and, and oranges. So wow. um, that's fun. We have a, an awesome screen printed label we just designed for that. So nice. That, that, that sounds good. Yeah, that's fine. And that's a dry me. I mean, it's the really dry. Alm, O M, like okay. the Tibetan, like gotcha. alm. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I think it's just really interesting. Um, what are your some of what are some of your favorite creations that superstition superstition meadery has done in the past six years? Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's hard to pick your you know you have children, it's hard to pick your favorite one. But you know, what are some of the ones that have stuck out that you've just been very proud of? That's a really good question. Um, you know, some of the rare things that we've done, like Endobelicus, which was a raspberry mead, mm-hmm. and Framboise Atondo, uh, the aged in port barrels. Um, with raspberry and Belgian candy sugar, those are definitely some of my These favorites. Are painful to hear the descriptions of. We we have um, <laughs> yeah. four tawny port barrels that'll be arriving uh, next week. That we're we're gonna make those again. So it's been nice. a long time. Wow. That I mean, every once in a while, I'll crack open one of those. That was the first time I ever actually brought mead home from mm. from like work to. That's put, awesome. Put in my basement, right? Yeah, that's um, awesome. So those are great. And then I mean, I'm looking at these aphrodisia barrels behind you, and. Um, you know, we won a silver and a gold medal for for aphrodisia, and that's you know like the primate we just you know tried. Yeah, I was looking at all those the different variations. And and it, it, it's not the rarest thing we make because we've got twenty four barrels of it, right? Compared yeah. to some other things, but it's so damn good. Yeah. And I, I'll never ever get tired of drinking that. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, uh, I was actually so kind of speaking of uh, kind of stuff. I kind of want to talk about the Toro Toro del Los Muertos. Okay, so we did a um, let's hey let's empty our glasses and we're gonna okay. try. So the the name that was the working title was like the Day of the Bulls because we made collaboration with Ren House on the Day of the Dead last year, November second. So gotcha. um, I'll tell you the new name and why it's called that in a second. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. There's a swallow and here comes some Noho Chmul, which is an interesting Mayan name. So over the Christmas holiday, the family and I went. Oh, I just ripped on some equipment. All right. Let's give you it's fine. It's what we do. That's good luck. We can buy more. Right. That's fine. Cool. All right. Hey, here's an app. <laughs> so um, we're having fun over here. <laughs> so we um, we were in, in Mexico, and we we went to the city of Coba, and it's this old Mayan city, and it's really cool because there's a pyramid there that you're still allowed to walk up. So most of those you know oh, tourist wow. areas, they kind of shut it down. And, mm-hmm. and it is sketchy if you're, if you're not paying attention, right? <laughs> you could go for a roll. So we were hanging out with our guide. Uh, all day riding our bikes around this cool jungle, you know, ancient city, and uh, and we get to the the pyramid, and I said, hey, um, you know, we make honey wine. It's like our thing, and I said, I know that you know the Mayans used to do that. And he said, yeah, and they use cacao nibs, and, you know, whatever, and, and he was telling me about these like special ceremonies they'll still do to this day where where it comes out, but it's kind of a, a rare thing. Am I stepping on the no, cord? No, you're right, good. Cool. And and he says that pyramid you're standing next to was built to honor the honeybee god Noho Chmul of ah. the Mayans, and we're like. We just made this awesome ingredient uh, or mole inspired, you know, over 100 ingredient meat. And we're like, that's a cool name. So that's where we came up with this, this odd name, right? And, and what we were going to drink right now just came out of a barrel before we started the segment. And there's actually 103 ingredients. We only counted water once, <laughs> but we had all different kinds of honey, all different kinds of vanilla, all different kinds of chilies, pumpkin seeds, spices. Uh, it's going to be double barrel aged. And we thought, uh, yeah, there's this myth, right, that in, in a Mexican village somewhere, there's a 100 ingredient mole. And so I actually saw um, one of those Netflix shows, right, where someone's doing that, which is kind of cool. Um, but as far as I knew, it was like this myth. Maybe they use 20 or 30 ingredients. And I love mole, right? And so we thought, let's try and do that in a meat. So let's see how this tastes. Yeah. Oh, wow. 
Someone may have a nail in their glass. I can hear it. I'm I'm gonna go with incredible. <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> I hear a nail too. Who's got a nail? Yeah, that. So that when Someone's we pull, when I nail. pulled the nail, like it went right into the. Uh, we call it the ambassador that mm. catches the sample. I, don't know. <laughs> I, Nate, I think Nate, you Is have it? The, hey, good. I'm glad. Don't swallow. That. He's the lucky one. Yeah. That's Actually, awesome. Oh no! no. It's not me. I do. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I, was, I was gonna say, yeah, sure, it's me, just so we can move along. But <laughs> no, nice. it's not me. Nope, it's me, Chris. Yeah. Chris, you don't gotta go swallow buy, that. You gotta go buy lottery tickets. <laughs> yeah, Hold on, guys. don't swallow that. <laughs> <laughs> this down. That's awesome. That smells incredible. Yeah. So this is a great example of where you can use chilies and you can taste chilies, but you're not getting heat. Like, and I love salsa and all that stuff. Right? Say but you, you, you get like the that heat, that kind of chili chipotle maybe yeah. kind of flavor. I mean, there's there's a little tang there. I wouldn't call it heat, but I mean, no you heat. know, there's definitely some, you know, capsaicin. Wow. Yeah, it's some, present but balanced. Right? Exactly. Yeah, Tastes it, kind of like it's not like meat. you know, it, it's a little tingle. It's not it's like holy delicious. shit. It, it's it. This is a hot mead. Yeah, it, it's not the case. But yeah, that's and like you, I'm I'm a huge mole guy. So yeah, this is incredible. That's yeah, delicious. lots of different types of cacao nibs were in there. It's yeah. Love it. God, that's amazing. Very, it tastes like iron. <laughs> you can keep that now. <laughs> 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 nah, dude. Chris is, tastes like iron. Chris, I missed that. Chris is choking on something. <laughs> oh, God. Someone, really someone Heimlich him. No, I, I, I will say this. Even with the nail in there, still phenomenal. Don't yeah, that's very good. Awesome. Care. That's going to be real good. Jeff, you're Jeez. a firefighter. Fix that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, could, I could fix it. Yeah. You sweep the mouth. Yeah. You sweep it. People can't see my hands. You sweep it first. <laughs> What is uh you are a full you are a full time firefighter? I am, yeah. What is your what's a normal week look like for you when you're doing that and running this yeah, running how, this metering? Man, how is that possible? That's I a mean, good question. I know you're a busy <laughs> guy because I've spoken with you over the email and over email and stuff, and I know you're a busy dude. But right. you know what's it what's a normal week look like for you? So I work um, fifty six hours a week in Phoenix, and then there's you know a commute involved. So it's yes. sixty six hours a week on average, just involved in getting to work and working. And, uh, and now my fire job has become like, you, you don't have a life when you have a, a full-time business and a full-time job, yeah. um, and a family, right. To, to manage right. everything. Yeah. And I think I do a pretty good job with that, that balance besides the sleeping part that should come <laughs> into play. Say. So yeah, you, you don't, you don't sleep a whole lot, you know, you're always figuring stuff out and balancing all those different things. But, but I love, uh, my fire gig right now. And yeah. so, you know, I'm doing at least 20 years in the system as, you know, um, me too slash point of pride slash it's, it's awesome. And, and I work, my crew is super cool. My station environment's awesome. And so I absolutely love that job more than I ever have at this point, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really challenging. And one of the hardest things for me as you know, I'm, you have to be super driven to pull this off. Right. And my wife and I are a great team. Uh, definitely couldn't have done any of this stuff without her. And I think the hardest part about all of that balance is accepting when I there's things I can't get done yeah. that I know it's that that's that list right, and it's just running through my head night and day, and I'm like I just there's no way I, I can do those things driving you know seventy five yeah. miles an hour yeah you're coming right. home you know yeah. like you just there's only so much you can do in, in a day or a week, um, so that's really frustrating to me because I always want to get all the all those tasks accomplished right yeah but again we. The, the cool thing about me still having that other gig is that we've had to hire people and create so many jobs. We have over 25 staff now. Wow. That's awesome. Which is like kind of unbelievable. I was going to that say, that's, that's huge for a peer and press. I mean, that's a, that's a big company. So your firefighter gig is in the Valley? You're in yeah. Phoenix? Yeah. Phoenix firefighter? Uh-huh. That's Where's, amazing. Where's your station at? Uh, like 16th Street and Thomas. Gotcha. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fun working downtown and nice doing all You're that. Not too far from our work, which is crazy. Yeah, um, I forgot what my next question was. So, uh, so I actually had one. Um, so we talked earlier about wandering tortoise, and uh, I saw on Instagram that uh, you are been inducted into the fellow Hampians Club, as we have been. Oh yeah, uh, that was fun. After yeah. those guys, a few times. Uh, so, is there any plans in the future to barrel age a Hampian? Wow, or hams wow. into a barrel, a mead barrel. Don't hams just came up with well, that we, idea. Could, we could don't, put don't bring beer it. in here, but if if hams was barrel aged, we could try and source one of those. There you well, go. Yeah, there well, you no, go. I'm saying, should we put mead in a ham, hams in a mead barrel? Maybe. Well, you can't do that here. <laughs> we'd, we'd have <laughs> no, no. to we'd have yeah. to send a barrel to hams. Yeah. So let yeah, me you know go. if you. Yeah, there we go. Set that up. We'll go wander and tortoise, and we'll just pop some cans, and we'll just Set, dump them in yeah, there. Yeah, just put like sixty just, cans in there. I just, yeah. I just want to get a barrel to put away. our homebrew in, man. <laughs> yeah, no we're, joke. We're coming up with all these ideas, and it's like, hey guys, I got an idea. Get the uh, look. The yeah. other thing I saw in there was that you got, you had, uh, a, so I've seen before, like a hair of the dog in, in Portland does a concrete 
you know, kind of like fermenter. Right. I saw you guys did a ceramic, kind of like a smaller thirty-eight gallon. I yeah. So I can I can show that to you guys later, but um, it's out yes, in our please. in our show. We haven't um we haven't fermented in it yet. Okay. And so um, I welded up a stand for it, right? And it turned out that um it was going to tip over. So <laughs> I need to weld on oh, yeah. um, a couple little arms and, and legs to the to the stand. It's almost complete. And so it's going to have these like six wheels. So we're calling it the Hexapus. And <laughs> so we're going to wheel the Hexapus around <laughs> nice. so we can not break our ceramic uh, vessel. But yeah, that's going to be really fun. I can't wait to have, um, you know, I guess a little more time, right, to do some of those things. Mm -hmm. Ceramic fermentation. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and so just as an example, I know there's like an Arizona ceramic company that's considering making ceramic fermentation vessels out of Arizona wow. clay. And so to do that would be great. you wow. know. And so we worked with um, uh, a ceramics major at ASU to make this particular vessel. Yeah. And, um, you know, but it wasn't Arizona clay. So that would be really cool to, yeah. as far as like different levels of terroir and whatnot. So yeah. it's the idea is that it's kind of like how barrels, right? The, the concrete itself or the, the ceramic actually will still kind of absorb some of the, the liquid inside of it and not we, kind of impart it maybe on the what else you put in there or what? That, that's the guess, right? Like, okay. so so it's, they call it vitrification and when you're in ceramics, right? Like this thing is like super vitrified so it's not going to leak, yeah. you know? So it's not, it's it's as little, like like the porosity is decreased as much as possible, right? So, right. However, because uh, you don't want your, your clay pot leaking <laughs> right, out your right, meat. Right, yeah. but, but I think, I would guess there would be a certain like minerality that you're going to get from the ceramics uh, just like you would get from from a concrete fermenter, okay. and I imagine those are pretty like polished inside and all that yeah, as well. But, but yeah, I think you're going to get something that you're not going to get from from wood or from yeah. a stainless fermenter. Part something, yeah. Cool. And it depends on how you seal it, and you know, and all yeah. of that as well. Very cool. But I'm looking forward to that. I mean, one day, you know, if I had my way, you'd, you'd walk <laughs> into like one room of our a facility, and it would look like you were in a you know Georgia, the country Georgian winery where there's you know these ceramic pots in the grounds Absolutely. filled with dirt to retain the you know the the, the so, temperature and all during fermentation so when yeah. i think of that i think of uh what's that uh oh man where they got the friggin to do oh, with the from the from, 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 from prometheus those, yeah. those, yeah. those, yeah. those poison the jars. jars the jars yeah i don't know if that's the same i guess they're underground probably not yeah it's not the same this is a delicious death yeah, i guess it would exactly be yeah, there you go so much acid yeah hmm. <laughs> yeah, continue. I I had one there. I just, so well, I really want to get into the like you said yes, earlier. You pointed this yes. giant flag out, and I definitely want to get into that. Oh, cool! The so, pirate flag, which is absolutely awesome. And and guys, before you that, the bull. Why why the bull? Great question. So our logo is based on an actual sculpture that's in a museum in in Crete, in Greece. Okay. And this sculpture was called a Riton. And it was made of steatite, is made of steatite with mother pearl and, and gilded wooden horns, and it was hollow. And so ancient Minoans uh, would use ritons as ceremonial objects, and they would use them to filter, they, they okay. believe, right? Like different, uh, whatever they were making, wine, okay. mead, beer, right? Craft beverages right. of the day. And, and in this case, um, they, would, they would fill this bull sculpture with mead, and they would poured out of the mouth of the bull on a temple as a libation to the gods in ancient ceremonies, which I thought was a great representation of superstition, superstition meter, what we okay. wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they used honey and they used grapes and they used grains and things um, that we use today, which is really cool. They, I think people use whatever they had seasonally you know, to make alcohol. Mm -hmm. but, but mead has always been, you know, it's the oldest fermented beverage. And our, our mission statement is to reintroduce the world's oldest fermented beverage to mankind. So every single thing we do, everything around you, Every time we talk to a customer, it's all in service to that mission. Very cool. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your uh, the guys your guys' guild. Wait, wait, wait! Before oh. you get into the guild, we have to talk about actually about the rest of the oh, this project me. with the pirates. Oh yeah, right. the, my apologies. Jesus, Nate, jumped, jumped in. the gun. I was <sighs> thinking. So, Man. so one of the new things that we're going to do before the year's over is we'll we'll start a rum barrel aging project. Wow. And so this is one time where um, I'm considering using um, you know honey from the Caribbean. You know, again for. You know, you have to have an intention, I think, if you're changing something that you do. And I think that could be a cool way to do that. Not necessarily going to go that way, but the rum barrels are going to be from there, which is really neat. Nice. And so I'm thinking like orange pina colada and salted caramel creme brulee. Things that you would like associate with rum would be really awesome yeah. uh, to make a meat out of. No kidding. So yeah, we that's thought, a killer idea. We thought for this project, let's get inspired, right? So behind us is a 12 by 8 foot pirate flag Excuse where me. we figuratively removed the skin and ears of our bull logo and we made a bull skull and then there's the Jack Rackham yes. 
Jolly Roger cross swords under it. And uh, I think that that's really kind of a, a cool thing. So that'll be on t-shirts and that'll be a logo on the bottles right. that's incredible. For, this, for this project. Awesome. Yeah, I need a shirt with that on it for Sold. sure. Yeah, shirt, hat, something. <laughs> um, I, I did. I just wanted to... Shut up and take my money. I just wanted to discuss you a little about you guys' guild. Um, I mean, I you know, I, I miss, I was snoozing in December. I must have been because I didn't even know you guys had one until this past year. Um, just seeing all the releases you guys have done the last couple months really caught wind. Um, you know, you guys did Super Scoop. Um, people are just like trying to get after that as much as possible because it's just a killer label and a, I'm sure a great need. But yeah, how has that been as an experience for you guys? It's, um, it's good. You know, I think that uh, we were inspired to do something special for the the first people that really got turned on to superstition and started sharing our products around the country and around the world and we thought let's let's invite them let's make something special and, and now we have 150 members every year and we try and make it so that you know it, it really is small batch and some are smaller yeah. than others in some cases you know there's only a couple extra bottles the go could even buy from one of them oh, and wow. in some cases there's you know there's there's more depending on the on the batch size right. but the deal with the guild is we make and release what we think is the best mead that we've made over the past year, uh, the following year. Usually the guild gathering, this party we do, is always in March. And so we're always thinking as we're like pulling nails like we did today, you know, what could be next year's guild bottle? Yeah. And some of those decisions happen, um, it'd be nice to know now for next year, but it's yeah. sometimes like a month ahead of time. Really? Like, this has got to be it, right? Yeah. And, um, and we do, you know, cool labels and all that stuff. Yeah. So when you're in our guild, you're going to get, you know, more than your sort of retail money's worth of your guild membership in bottles at the guild gathering, right? right. You're also going to get invited to the guild gathering. And, and so far, we've, we've kept the size and, and the venue so that you can also bring a plus one. And nice. so you get to bring a friend or, or whatnot, or your spouse. You In the gathering, there's you know, foods included. It's, and you don't pay for this, nice. right? I mean, besides your guild membership. Yeah. And you know, there's music. And, and you get to try all of your guild bottles with this passport we stamp for free. So the idea is that you wow. don't have to open your bottles and still know what they taste like. That's then, of course, there's cool. other things for sale that we have and, and yeah. one-offs we release and, and things. So um, we make it a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, there's always specials going on in the tasting room. And there's always a secret after party you can find out about maybe if you're lucky and, and have, a, <laughs> have a killer bottle share. <laughs> so um, Very it, cool. it's a lot of fun. And you get 10% off in the tasting room all year. You have nice. your own private guild web store to wow. buy bottles with 10% off there all the time as well. Cool. And so not everything gets released ahead of time to the guild, but we right. definitely do certain things where the guild has early access to some of our special releases. So there's some other benefits in there. And those guild bottles, uh, we sort of reserve the right to take a keg or two to a festival because we think it's that good. Yeah. But we're only ever going to sell those bottles to the guild or in our tasting room. So anything that goes unsold, it's only available <clears throat> Uh, you know, right out of our you know, on-premise location in Prescott. Very cool. I'm really? gonna I'm gonna need to buy like a whole barrel of that <laughs> Devour the Sun just <laughs> right off the bat. I I need like a whole barrel of that. Yeah, that's in my ridiculous. Life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very cool. I'm very just very interested <laughs> in that. I mean, you say you say words like exclusive, and you can only get and uh, a bunch of beer geeks like us and people probably listening are like, I'm in. I like I yeah. want all those words S sold. Thank you. Some some things you have to keep special, you yeah. know, and and some things we we only have one barrel of, and it's sad when it's gone to us too, you know, yeah. and, we're like, and and some you know we'll incrementally increase some of the more popular bottles, you know, like mm -hmm. I think we're gonna we're gonna make Super Scoop again because it's really popular, but yeah. you know we're not gonna make a thousand gallons of it, you right. know, we might make you know two barrels or whatever, so. Yeah. You know, and, and, and a lot of the Guild bottles, you know, just the raw ingredients in these things are really expensive as yeah. well. Um, and you can Tons tell when you taste it. Small batches. Yes. Right. Well, Give us a call. Let us help make it. All right. Yeah. So you guys want to take a break real quick? Yeah, and, I'll take uh, another quick break and then come back and finish up. Talk sounds good, guys. Events and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, buddy. All right, guys, we're back. We've got another uh, another glass of uh, delicious mead here, and we're back to talk. Uh, we're having some blueberry hex. Jeff just hooked us up with, by the way. Thank I'm you in. very much. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. Not not Jeff Brecken. Treating us uh, way too nice. Yeah, no, Jeff's not that nice. <laughs> Jeff Brecken's not that nice. <laughs> that dick. Jeff Herbert's a classy dude. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Uh, just to, Thank you so much for sharing all this incredible mead with us today. Yeah. Uh, you've it's you guys this is a blast you know it's it's fun anytime i get a chance to talk about what we're doing it, I, I enjoy it so thanks it's a fun discussion yeah i'm i'm, I'm scandinavian so this uh, at the blood. risk of being cliche this is my valhalla i mean i'm, <laughs> nice. I'm surrounded by barrels of mead and, and it, yeah it, it's 
Yeah, well, I, 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 tell I you, feel I feel I need to kill you guys to to die an honorable mm-hmm. death. No. <laughs> we could we could arrange that. <laughs> Someone hit me in the head with a hammer, quick. Well, we just emptied sixteen barrels today, and if you guys came back in even about four weeks, we're gonna have eight French oak barrels, sixteen new American oak barrels for the White Series. We've got another. Uh, we have sixteen barrels on the way from uh, from Kentucky that were. It's actually. Um, Woodford Reserve Single Malt American Whiskey Aged in Bourbon Barrels. barrels. Wow. Um, so I hear they're sloppy Hell. wet, and I'll make some awesome lager mosting oil <laughs> for us. Fuck yeah. We've got, uh, so something that we've never done, and I don't know if anyone else has as far as mead goes, uh, you know, spirits barrels for bourbon anyways, right, are 53 gallons. It's heavy charred, new American oak, never been used to make bourbon. We have a company making us barrels in South Carolina just like that. And so we have... I mean, I have an idea, but really no idea what's going to happen when we put mead into this heavy charred new American oak that's never had anything in it. That's cool. So we have eight of those that are being made right now. And so we're going to have, th- this is going to be four high and, and across the wall um, uh, next time you guys come yeah, back. I was say, you have a little room to grow. <laughs> that's, yeah. That sounded suspiciously like an invitation. Oh, yeah. No, please <laughs> yeah, yeah. do. No, it'd be fun to make some of you guys too. Yes. We, we measured, um, we can get a ladder and check the heads, you know, pull nails like we did earlier. Yeah. For all the barrels, if we fill the side of the room up, uh, we could have 196 barrels stacked four high over here, wow. and the goal, if we if we build another building soon, is to have this side, uh, you know, like behind you guys, you can see all of our kegs and bottles and stuff that mm-hmm. are staged and get ready to go around the country, around the world, and that is going to be a fooder forest. Wow, nice. that's the idea. We all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, nice. Wait, wait. He's like blew our minds collectively. Uh, <laughs> also, to keep that going, you guys have like two decent sized storage containers right outside. What's going on in those? Yeah, so. Um, you know, you're looking at like 20 bucks a foot to get a storage container. And so, you know, I thought it'd be cool to, to have them paint it to match the building. You guys may have noticed they don't match the building, but they <laughs> are didn't cl- they, they're barrel close. rack red. They're the exact same color oh, okay. as the barrel. Yeah. So now we say we did it on purpose. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. one day That's we might cool. move those inside and you'd be like, oh man, those are a perfect match for those barrel racks. Yep. So, um, yeah. so yeah, we have, um, you know, like empty kegs, empty bottles, things like that, that, you know, we have uh, boxes for our, you know, so if you guys are, are listening and especially if you're out in Arizona, but out of Arizona, if you want something shipped to you, we can ship to 38 states plus DC through our web store. And so we've got lots of shipping boxes out there ready to be packed as well. So that's what we have out there. Very, Very nice. cool. So in a month you have your sixth anniversary. Right. So um, Memorial Day weekend, uh, that Saturday especially, uh, we're going to have some, we haven't announced it yet, but some bottles coming out that'll be really cool and some one-off things that we've never made before uh, on tap in our tasting room. And so that's always a a fun time to come up. And um, one thing that we do is, uh, you know, we talked about the Guild Gathering and Barry White Day that are two really big special events we plan for each year. Um, We're going to start doing more for our anniversary and we're going to try and do something for probably Labor Day weekend, maybe starting this year. If not, 2019 is going to see like four significant events with really special releases from Superstition. We keep gearing up for that. Our collaborations are instead of doing you know, 60 gallons. Now we're trying to do two to four barrels with everyone that we work with because it's almost the same amount of time and it's just, we couldn't afford things like French yeah. oak. I mean, it's a thousand dollars to yeah. get a French oak barrel here, right? right. Which Holy is crazy. Cow. Really? Just, just one. one, one barrel. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That fucking blows my mind, Jeff. I'll be honest with you. That's great. One thousand dollars for one of those barrels. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, yeah. And no so wonder. American oak, they're about half of that, you know, and then yeah. bourbon barrels are a little bit less. Um, right delivered but uh but yeah that's that's amazing i mean to think about that is great you wouldn't you wouldn't honestly put that kind of value on something like that without thinking about it and where it comes from and the work that goes into it but yeah that's crazy that's what's crazy well that's Uh, that's exciting so uh it's also mead day right yeah so the first saturday in august every year is mead day and so uh we just got invited to an event at at b nectar it's their 10 year anniversary uh, party as well and so i don't know if my wife and i can go to that yet but we're figuring that out but we'll we plant we just said hey we're, we'll definitely be involved we got to figure out the details um so um but yeah every every first saturday in august we do something special in our tasting room and one of the fun things we do we don't um you know, there, we we love the traditions of mead and the Viking stories and Robin Hood, and we we have references to that in our labels and the stories that we tell every day. If you come in and, and visit our tasting room, so cool. but at the same time, we want mead to stand on its own as like a modern, amazing beverage, right? And so, but we still go back sometimes, and and we do some fun stuff. So one of those things is we have, um, if you show up in a mead related costume, you you get a discount <laughs> on mead day. And we last year we had a guy with a furry like cod piece. And a sword, 
and he was all you know tribal tatted up and you knew he tanned for the event it was i sat down with him and his girlfriend i'm like i gotta buy you guys a drink this is awesome <laughs> so so we have a lot of fun our staff dresses up and there's all different there's That's like cool. maid marion chicks walking around and yeah it's it's fun That's awesome I, I already got a costume for that <laughs> right on Done. I don't think stormtroopers. <laughs> yeah. I don't think stormtroopers. Uh, you guys have seen it. You guys have seen my Ragnar costume. Oh yeah, there, okay. you go. there we nice. go. Nice. Oh, and mm. yeah, I, I have never missed one of those shows. Man, the Vikings is awesome. So oh, there you go. Agreed. So yeah, that's coming up at the end of the month. Uh, excuse me, that was your anniversary. It's coming up at the end of the month. That's August. We just talked about then. Um, Anything else, Chris? No, I mean, at this point, yeah. They, Other than gushing about your uh, metery, Jeff, I mean, we could go about that. We could probably add an extra 30 minutes for that, but sure. we'll, get down to your, uh, we'll get down to your tap room. But cool. Thank you so much for having us. Um, right on, guys. Where we can, uh, I guess, where we can, uh, where anybody listening can go check your stuff out, go check out you, what you guys you know, have go, to Go to our website, and, uh, and, and right now we're fixing the event plugin from Facebook, but if you follow us, on Facebook, you can you can subscribe to our events, and we have free tasting events anywhere what? from like four to six times a week somewhere around the state. I was gonna say I see yeah. you guys at uh, tasting events. Yeah, Bottle Crazy. Logic a lot, or not Bottle Logic, uh, Bottle Shop Forty Eight. And if you're in the Valley and you haven't had a chance, you need to stop by right. and try one of those. Uh, we saw we, we saw you guys at Juicy Brews. We were there. Actually, yes. talked to those guys. So yeah. you guys there? That was amazing. That's really cool. So. Yeah, so so please subscribe to our events if you want to know what's going on where you go out and you know try the new stuff for free, right? Uh, see what we're doing in the tasting room. We have live music every Friday and Saturday night in Prescott. If you want to come up and, and make a weekend out of it, if you're from out of town, that's a lot of fun. And on our on our site, you know, we list you know about almost 140 accounts in Arizona now where you can go find our stuff. Very cool. Yeah, uh, Instagram. You guys are Instagram as well. We are, and you know, we have a lot of fun on there. And then, and by the way, we talked about, for example, the the collab we tried with a over 100 ingredient mole mead. Go to, we have, it's funny, we, you know, there's, we have a fair amount of followers on, on Instagram, Facebook. We've only got like 30 followers on our YouTube channel, but there's some really funny stuff on really? there. I was going to say, yeah. well, you have, you've leaked to them on your, your, uh, your guys' website too. And yeah. there's some really good videos on there. They're actually oh, pretty darn. Fun. We've done some really out. fun, like movie trailers yeah. uh, nice. about our collaborations and like the one with, you know, Ren House was really cool. Right. So, oh, so yeah, yeah, go check that out. And there's, we're still working on those. So as soon as those French oak barrels come, we're going to do one with the, what we did with Wilderness and the. You know, Very pressing cool. and crushing and all that. So awesome. Yeah, That's it was cool. a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much, man. Uh, for us, you can find us at Hoppy Craftsman on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, you can find us. Our website is hoppycraftsman.beer as well. Oh, yeah, we or, have a website. Uh, yeah, we do have a website. It's pretty Oops. crazy. And then, Jeff, who are the rest fucking people in the world? Reddest fucking people in the world. Cena Gomez, San Diego Beer Talk Radio, yes, Mark man. Bosteros, Javier Gonzalez, and Phil Mitchell Wall. Thanks, Phil. Mitchell Wall. Uh, these people are our patron supporters. They actually support the show, make this happen. Uh, if you want to be a mom, be a patron supporter, go to patreon.com slash hoppy craftsman and uh, support the show, man. So, well, guys, thanks, th- guys. Thank you again for being here and, and thanks for, for spreading the word about Arizona, what's going on here, because it's, it's an awesome place to be. Yeah. Thanks for having it, us. It, like we'll be Nate, back. Like Nate said, this is this was like a bucket list show for us. Yeah. So big time. Yeah, so. It's, it's it's awesome we'll, to be out here. We'll be in contact. Let's go downtown and drink. Let's do it. Do it. All right, guys. Later. Thanks, guys.